Welcome to the Gone Jeep and Show with your hosts, Rick Payway and Tracy Clark. Grab your favorite beverage, kick back, put your feet up, and have a listen. Hi, Gone Jeep and fans. Welcome to the Gone Jeep and Show, episode eight. I'm your host, Rick Payway. I'm your co-host, Tracy Clark, and we've got an action-packed episode for you again this week. We have members of the Gone Jeep and Show cast, Greg Henderson, Mike Harrington, Liam Lafferty, and Tyler Donaldson with us today. Yes, I know that's not all of us, but we all have regular jobs, too, and regular lives, so we're lucky to get six on our show today. Next time, we may even have some uh, other people. Tracy? Yeah, you never know what's going to happen. We may have random people jumping in and out throughout the episode. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's why you got to stay tuned and you've got to listen. You've got to watch. Actually, actually, that's what makes Gun Jeep and unique and kind of special. You never know what you're going to find out. So we're going into all Jeep all the time. And this week we're going to talk about the noise laws in Moab. If you remember before Easter Jeep Safari was canceled and reinstated and canceled, the city council had some noise ordinances related to not Jeeps, of course, but they had some, some ordinances and there was some concern about noise. Well, turns out since that time, they've probably got a few more interesting facts and figures in, and I think Tracy can probably speak to this. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> this was kind of passed on the sly. There was not a lot of public input that was allowed. Um, the first ordinance that was back before Easter Jeep Safari was an OHV law. So that took a lot of heat. So now they went into a noise ordinance law. Believe it or not, you can get six free months of lodging <laughs> in Moab if you violate it. Yeah. Up to six months in jail and a thousand dollars in fines, and the standards are being considered are much more restrictive. And this was what I could find prior to it being passed, and, and it passed almost unanimously, from what I understand. And it's more restrictive than federal or most other municipalities that have adopted similar ordinance, ordinances. Moab City proposed a reduction from 92 decibels to 85 decibels at night. That passed. So now it's 85 decibels at night. And that's from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Monday through Saturday and 9 a.m. on Sunday. Because <laughs> Sunday is different, right? Right. Noise sounds different on Sunday. Everybody knows that. Knows that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you, can't wake up, you can't wake up in the morning and mow your lawn anymore. No, not in Moab. Um, the sound limit at 50 feet of 74 decibels during the day and 72 at night are also too severe. Okay, that was their their pass by sound limit, and, and this is getting kind of crazy. I mean, you guys, if if you want to check it out, get on Facebook, look at the Utah Public Lands Alliance. They've got a ton of of information about it. And you can click on the link and it will get more in depth with what has actually been passed. And while I agree, some of the side-by-sides can be very noisy. The Harleys going down Main Street, can it, I mean, that's insane. Some of the semi-trucks going down Main Street can be really insane. But in the long run, what does it mean for jeepers i mean even some of our tow rigs that were coming into town in i think it's it's going to make things a little bit more difficult but i think the real problem is going to be enforcement how many city cops work in moab the moab ordinance i don't think they're going to have the highway patrol or the sheriff's department sitting out there with a sound meter throwing out tickets Maybe it's going to be one of those things where an ATV nails it or side by side nails it coming out of the gas station, passes a cop, and the cop's going, That's too loud, and then go chases them down, just like if they're doing a smoky burnout. And that, that can happen with Jeeps, trucks, hot rods, etc. So I'm not quite sure it's going to be 
a true issue. What do you think, Tyler? Well, I was just going to say that ordinances and, and laws like this always end up falling heavily on the side of officer discretion. So I think what's going to happen is <clears throat> the if people complain about you, you're going to get cited. And if you are blatantly obnoxious, you're going to get cited. Other than that, uh, it's going to be so subjective. I mean, I don't know any officer in the state of Utah that runs around with a, with a decibel meter in their car. And I'm right. pretty sure their taser now. <laughs> well, the taser is probably close to 90 decibels when it goes off, you know, I mean, who knows it's going to end up being really subjective. And I think what, what's going to happen is the people who are obnoxious about revving their engines and, and, and causing a ruckus will end up getting cited. And then it'll be, It'll be interesting to see what what the the justice court judge does down there, what the city prosecutor does down there, whether they'll try to make a couple of, you know, make an example of a few people so that the word is out or whether, you know, the the city may pass the ordinance, but it's up to the officers to to enforce it. And they may just choose not to enforce it. I mean, it's it's hard to say what's going to happen. I don't I don't have a a finger on the pulse of the, of the police agency down there well enough to know what their attitude is about the ordinance, but that, that is going to have a lot to do with how it's enforced. Well, I do know that on some of our uh, ultimate adventures, we went to parks that did have noise ordinances and sure enough, we trundled up to the gate, each vehicle separately and got a reading from a sound meter from the park administrator before we went in. Now, of course, that's at idle. So anything can happen off idle. But the fact of the matter is that they wanted us to at least start with that and go from there. Great. Yeah, because, you know, doing a sound ordinance in general, because it's not vehicle specific, um, you know, power goes out and people start turning their generators on. Uh oh, <laughs> now the police are knocking on your door because the neighbor's mad that your generator's running and they don't have power. You know, I mean, it, it's it's a slippery slope to enact these ordinances and rules that can harm not only the obnoxious people, but people that are doing normal stuff, too. Um, like my generator, when I saw that the other day, I turned my generator on and I put a decibel meter on it and my generator runs at 95 decibels. So and it's only three years old in stock. Um yeah. How far no, away so were you measuring it, though? Three feet? 20 feet. Okay, 20 feet. Is there a standard? Tracy, did you get to uh, read anything about a standard of how far away they measured it? And if you're next there, to a wall or anything else? There are, are several different things that they're stating. One was at 25 feet for idle, and then... Mm -hmm. something was at 74 feet. I mean, there's 15 pages oh, in this oh, ordinance. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel sorry for, pages. you know, the, the law enforcement officers who have to deal with it because they are, you know, yes, you're going to get the people who are being obnoxious. And if you're being obnoxious, you should get cited anyway, because you're being a jerk, but Absolutely. you're also going to get the regular people who call on their neighbor because they're mowing the lawn and their lawnmower is too loud and stuff like that. And that's just wasting, you know, law enforcement's time. And I, I, I hate to see that. Anytime we waste the time of good law enforcement officers to do remedial junk like this, I don't know that, that bugs me more. They, they have more important things to do than go over to some neighbor who's complaining about his neighbor. Unless it's two in the morning with a lawnmower. Yeah. Well, again, now you're being obnoxious, but still calling the police, you know, okay, just go so, over and tell your neighbor to shut up. So why don't we have an obnoxious or jerk ordinance? It's right. it is not illegal to be a jerk, but I can tell you. It should be. An ordinance like this that is that subjective. The first person that hires a decent attorney is going to get that thrown right out of court. And I the agree. officer will be wasting his day off in court on a case that he didn't want to write the citation and he's going to lose the case 
And that word will spread and the officers won't do those tickets anymore. They just they're not going to want to waste their time on their days off in court in a case they know they're going to lose if anybody hires even a halfway decent attorney. Absolutely. Very safe. I mean, you know, you have all these neighborhood watch groups and and those are great because it's neighbors keeping an eye out on neighbors. So what are we going to have the neighborhood noise police now? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and it is Moab. You know, how many times have any of us been out on the trail and somebody ripped their muffler off? So Whoa, you were yes. perfectly yeah. in compliance on your way out to the trail. On your way back, you're no longer in compliance. What do you do? You get a ticket. Right. And spend six months in jail. Yeah, get or, a ticket. Or park it at the trailhead and go get the trailer or toe strap it down or, or something. But still, I, I think... There's a lot of gray area here. I understand that the residents of Moab want some of their peace and quiet back because they're inundated pretty much 365 every year, you know? Yep. Okay. Is it all the residents or is it just the new transplants? Uh, Regardless, everybody's entitled to a quiet life. But let me put this up. What if? Every one of those Jeeps and loud ATVs were replaced with an electric Wrangler. You mean the new 4xE, Rick? Yeah, the new 4xE that is quiet, quieter than a mouse, except for a few little quirks about it, which I can tell you about. I mean, you can go zero to 60. You, yes, you can squeal your tires. Okay, so maybe that'll screw up some, some officers there. but. It doesn't make noise, all right? Well, why don't you tell us about it in Jeep Beat? Because you had the opportunity to head down (laughs) south to Texas and drive that last week, didn't you? I did. I did. I flew down to Austin, which is an interesting town. They say keep Austin weird because it is, but it's a good place. Uh, But that's where they had the media launch. Isn't that where they make Tito's vodka? We don't talk about Tito's. <laughs> that's good stuff. Now watch you. No, I said, isn't that where Austin? That's where yeah. it's made. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Austin is a wonderful little town that is growing by leaps and bounds. And because of that, uh, Jeep gave us the, the introduction there so that we could do a lot of city driving, highway driving, country driving, and of course, off-road because there's a few off-road areas there that I've been to before. Really cool. And the first thing I thought was, well, okay, you know, I'll keep an open mind. I mean, I've been a hybrid Jeep driver all my life. In case you didn't know it, our engines are started by a starter motor. So, boom, there we go. We drive electric Jeeps. But this 4xE is really kind of cool because it has 21 miles of range, pure electric, quietness, highway, trail, wherever you are. But it has the turbo four-cylinder. With the e-start electric motor, so that helps that Turbo 4 get up to speed. And then there's an electric motor in the torque flight transmission. It replaces, basically replaces the torque converter. And it, the battery packs under the seat. It's about, oh, let's say about 500 pounds. So the center of gravity moves backwards and downwards. And it really makes the Jeep feel like it's planted on the road and on the rock. It's really kind of interesting. And... I, for one, I loved it. Uh, I don't. I don't have a problem with technology moving forward. I mean, if we didn't have technology, we wouldn't have a four-speed transmission with the Granny Low instead of a three-speed T90. You know, Willys, right? Nothing wrong with that. Same way with fuel injection, right, Liam? Yeah, let's put a carburetor on your Jeep, right? No, I don't think so. There's nothing wrong with technology if it's put in the right place. So. Uh, I think this is where the majority of the world is going towards electric vehicles. Whether you personally think it's a smart thing or not, uh, yeah, there's drawbacks. Hopefully our technology will cure all those drawbacks. But it will, great. It's on the road, great. Zero to 60 in like six seconds. You know, that's pretty impressive. So a couple of questions I've had, because I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, it's only got 21 miles of range. But but that's just on pure electric. So it's pure electric, uh, yeah. right? On a full tank of fuel, how? F- what is the range 
from fuel stop to fuel stop using electric and fuel. Do you have that information? I don't have the actual figure, but it's at least 250, 300 miles on just the fuel tank. Now, they did have to make the fuel tank just a skosh smaller. They had to uh, make the floor pan a little different. I mean, electric Wrangler and different Wrangler isn't exactly the same vehicle. It's just like the 392 where they changed the frame for some strength. And they also changed the uh, suspension for this vehicle because it is heavier, but the power to weight ratio is better. So that it's not that big of a deal. So yeah, it'll go wherever you want. It's a regular turbo four cylinder. So you have the hybrid mode, you have full electric, and then what they call e-save, which saves as much battery power as possible. And the, the other cool thing is the regeneration button. Boop, you hit that. And when you slow down, it slows the vehicle down, just like if you're putting on the brakes. It feels more like a regular internal combustion engine doing uh, compression braking. It's not, but that's what it feels like. I mean, you physically feel yourself go forward. And to coast, so, that, so to speak, you have to give the uh, pedal a little bit of throttle. You have to press on it so, so it doesn't slow you down too much. They even said... They have the brake lights will come on in certain instances because it's slowing you down so much. Yeah. Computer and algorithm. Crazy. And the, re the regeneration button also, when you're doing that, it's recharging the battery, correct? Yeah, exactly. And that's the cool thing. So you have the ability, if you're on a long downgrade and you're just coasting, so to speak, with max regen on, yeah, you're putting power back into the uh, battery pack. Well, that'll save some brakes going down the mountain. Right. It really does. I mean, I read something on a forum where a guy said, oh, that's really stupid. You should uh, make sure you use the brakes to it because brakes are easy to replace and they're cheap. What? Really? I mean, how short-sighted is that, right? I mean, no, I, 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 apparently he's not. A Jake break, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Apparently he's not uh, warped a whole bunch of rotors and stuff like that in his lifetime. So. No, 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 not at all. So o overall, I, I I really loved the Wrangler 4xe. And, you know, they have three different ones. They have the Rubicon, of course, the standard, and then the Sahara. And the Sahara and the, and the 4xe gets 20-inch wheels because that's what people want nowadays. Thank God the Rubicon still has the 17s. So Did, did they give you any indication if they were going to do it in the JT or not? No indication. I think the comment is uh, we generally don't comment on future products. Okay, so so that that's like the the three ninety two and the JT. But the the one I'm curious about is they're offering a high altitude package. So I, I'm kind of curious to maybe test drive one of the four by E high altitudes because I'm at a high altitude. So. Unfortunately, Tracy. Right. The, uh, the high altitude package is what I refer to as the I prefer rap music package. Ooh, it's, no. Um, the, the bumpers are painted. The interior is phenomenally fancy. And uh, it is made for the road only. The high altitude, the high and high altitude is high price. And that's about it. <laughs> okay, so it, it fits well with, with the area where I live, where everybody is high and we're not talking about an elevation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's um, It has more place on social media than it does on the trails, unfortunately. But it's still a Jeep underneath. So, you know, 20 years from now, I might still buy one because it's got some cool seats and tear everything else off. Who knows? Yeah, but look at a look at a Willys edition or a Sahara. I mean, you know, there's a lot of editions that are literally just lipstick on a pig. Uh, so who cares? You know, some people might want the painted flares and the painted bumpers and stuff, and they'll still be able to modify it just like any other Jeep. So uh, good for good for Stellantis for coming out with a bunch of premium packages so people can get their fill. I, I like then the I'm idea. just going back to the Rubicon. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I like the idea. I think uh, just like what Rick said, you know, moving technology forward and following our vehicles along with technology, it's a good thing. Um, and for a company, because I've worked with some of these major companies, you know, they have to keep a certain gas mileage across their entire fleet. Um, mm -hmm. The federal government says so. So moving some of this 
high-end technology into the Wranglers that we love and the Jeeps that we love, um, keeps the company at whole in that guideline. It's a win-win for everybody because even if this is the first step, it's just going to get better from here. Absolutely. It's the same ideas. If Jeep had only stopped making CJ7s and never even made a Wrangler and the XJs and everything else, they would have been out of business. All these new vehicles with new technology and higher fuel economy actually helps the brand move forward. And really about, we, we want our stuff. We got to make sure everybody else gets a piece of the pie too. Yeah, for, for people who haven't seen it, if they if they look backwards on the Gone Jeep and YouTube channel, there's a YouTube video called Remembering Phil Tony. And, and they talked about Phil Tony and Dave Thompson in that video talked about the inception of the Wrangler, which was the YJ, and why it came about uh, because the CJ and the rollover issues and blah, blah, blah. But technology keeps making everything better. And that's why we have the Jeeps that we have today. So 20 years from now, somebody can talk about the first four by E and how it's made the Jeep in 20 years so much better. So yeah, run with it. I, I like the idea. Um, and if you haven't seen that video on Gone Jeep and go back through the YouTube and watch it. Right. Yeah, for and, sure. And speaking of YouTube, if you guys want to learn more about the four by E and the driving impressions and actually see how it handled on the trail in the water and in town, Go to our YouTube channel. We do have a video on there about uh, Rick's trip in Texas with the 4 by e That's right. And then, of course, make sure you share, like, and subscribe. There it and, is. And, and, and speaking of that, we, we've got some, some gone Jeep and news, and we kind of want to know what you, are, our listeners, fans, and followers, think about this. Um, you know, it, it does cost us a little bit of money to – Put all this stuff together and we don't have a whole lot coming back in so liam you want to take it away and let everybody know what what we're proposing and we want we want your input we're not going to do this without your input because you guys are the ones that matter the most yeah i can take this one so like tracy's saying what we're proposing is something called YouTube memberships. And unlike other creators who possibly make videos just for members, we're not doing that. We're not taking away content from anybody. Um, but we do want to take the podcast. So this video podcast, if you're watching the video, our proposal is that members would get to see it first and then maybe a week or two weeks or whatever that happens to be later, then it's free and open to everyone else. The audio version would still be immediate. You could listen to it right away. Um, but if you weren't a paid member, then you would have to wait you know, a week or two to see the video podcast. The reason why we're doing that is because this is our most expensive medium. Um, it takes a lot of manpower, it takes a lot of hours to put together the podcast, and we want to continue doing it. And until we can get some kind of sponsorship, this is really the best way to keep the lights on. Now, it's not a lot of money for you guys. Um, it's I think what's our bottom tier is like a dollar a month. And then we have a higher tier, which uh, has some added benefits we're still discussing. And that one is uh, like two or three bucks a month. So it's not like we're asking for a serious commitment here. Um, it's just more let's keep the lights on. And then uh, if we do go ahead with this, we will have some future videos explaining exactly how to do it and what it means for you. There's uh, some cool icons that go next to your name on YouTube uh, that we can share with you later, as well as you get some different emojis. So you can say, hey, I was just driving my XJ and then post a picture, an emoji of an XJ. Um, so we thought it'd be kind of fun to offer that to the members. But like Tracy said, we're uh, looking for your feedback. If this is a great idea, uh, like I said, we're not taking anything away, just a little bit of a time difference for members versus non-members. Tell us what you think. If you think this is just the dumbest money grab you've ever heard, uh, tell us how we can keep the lights on then. I don't know. <laughs> so, no, I, I think it's a great idea. Absolutely. I mean, so that's what we're looking at. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's better than, you know, doing the gone Jeep and GoFundMe thing because, you know, it would still kind of be the same thing, but th this gives you the opportunity to tell us what you think. It it could be a buck a month or it could be two or three bucks a month. Uh, it would solely be up to you. So, you know, if you're doing a buck a month, 
12 bucks a year, that's just a little bit more than one McDonald's meal for a single person, you know? That's true. I, I do it. I'll sign up. How do I do it? Oh, wait, I'm on this side. Yeah, you're could, on this side of it. <laughs> could you get it? Could you give up a couple of Starbucks coffees or could you give up one fast food meal for a month to help support us, bring you all Jeep, all the time, content on Gun Jeepin? That's right. For less than a beer a month, you too can help Gun Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, back in the magazine days, I don't remember any year subscription that was 12 bucks. They gave me nearly as much content as as you get at Gone Jeepin'. So that's right. one way. To, well, yeah. And that's yeah. the thing, too, is we're talking about one item and a time delay. You still get everything for free. Um, Instagram, Facebook, the audio podcast, everything is still free. And the video podcast is still free. You just have to wait. If you want it right away and you want to be a part of something, that's where the memberships come in. And I think the other thing we were discussing is the higher tier. Uh, we... We're looking at the opportunity to put names and like credits so then you can publicly show people, hey, I, I'm a part of that. I'm one of the people that made that happen. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a supporter. Yeah. We're the club. Yeah. So, so let us know what you guys think. We, we value your opinions, your input. We won't do this with, without hearing what you guys have to say. So chime in. Drop a comment on the video cast. Drop a comment in on social media when we let you know that this episode of the podcast is live. Send us an email at contact at gone-gpn.com. Let us know what you think. We value your opinion. We, we can't do this without you. All right. With that being said, just remember, we're not going to give you any Bronco content either. Well, maybe. Well, okay, maybe a little bit, but still. Keep stomping on Broncos, maybe. So, well, that, 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 <laughs> Casey? In, in light bars for lockers, um, we're not necessarily answering any particular fans' questions, but <laughs> kind of can combining some of the questions that we've seen and, and some stuff that I've seen on social media. We did a, a video last year about Jeep Easter eggs and it still has traction. There's still people that I'm seeing that are fairly new. My Jeep has a little Jeep in, in the windshield or my Jeep has this or my Jeep has that. And Oh, wow. I just found the sandals on my Jeep. So mm -hmm. the, these are Easter eggs and I I did notice in a post here recently that Bronco is coming out with their own. And the question was, what would you call this? And there was a photo. And some people were saying a lasso. Some people were saying a lariat. And me, I'm saying, well, it's a call for a toe strap. <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah. Ford, what does Ford stand for? Found on the road. Day. On race day. Oh, found on the road. But day. last to finish. <laughs> uh, fix and repair road. daily. Uh, found on road dead. <clears throat> Dirty word. <laughs> Overrated dodge. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah, but there's a lot of those. For you know, just to play devil's advocate, there's a lot of those for Jeep too. You know, just empty every pocket, and but yeah, but no, <laughs> yeah, you know, we know that <laughs> we know that. So anyway, um, Easter eggs in Jeep have been around for decades, decades and decades and decades, and there are some really cool ones, and there are some really make you scratch your head and say, what the what? So All right. we're going to let Rick talk about the early ones and then, then we're going to go further into it. Yeah. You, a lot of people think that Easter eggs started in World War II. And in a way they did, because when the first 
Jeeps were produced, the final versions that came out between Bantam Willys and Ford actually had the manufacturer's name stamped into the back panel. Not Bantam, but the Willys and the Ford did. So that was all fine and good and until the government said, no, you're not. These are army vehicles. I don't care who's making them. Sort of like a 1911 uh, 45 made by five different companies. Okay, little letters maybe it says who, who made them, but not the entire back panel saying Willys. I mean, that'd be as bad as the Ram trucks today. I swear it says Ram and it's, you know, five feet long. Like you don't know it's a Ram truck. So anyway, I digress. So yeah, Easter eggs you could say started back then. Going forward, you see small ones like little AMC insignias. Oh, I think you can find those on some 72 to 73 CJ5s. Uh, but it really got going with the new TJs, JKs, and of course, JLs. My favorite one, of course, has to be my sandals on the JT and the JL. If you haven't found those, look on the plastic top cover where the wiper motors go through. And over on the right-hand side, unless you're in Australia, it'll be on the left-hand side, are a pair of sandals. And I'm not going to say anything more about that, but if you want to just Google Rick Payway Jeep Sandals, you go for it. Greg, what are your favorites? Oh, boy. Um, I think, the, surprisingly enough, the sandals were my first um, really, ex I like, I was excited about it because when I knew about it before it came into production, and it was, you know, one of my friends who's a lunatic fringe guy. And he was telling me that, hey, they did Payway sandals, you know, and, and I thought that was really cool. Um, some of the other ones, you know, they started putting willies, uh, little willies Jeeps all over the JK. They were on the wheels. They were on the windshield. There were a few other places. Um, one that I saw recently that I didn't even know about um, was the drive shaft. So they actually have a Jeep grill on the drive shaft of the JLs and the JTs. So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, I think Ford hit them really hard way back in the day because, you know, Henry was a stickler and he put a, a talicized F on every bolt on the whole thing, basically. Um, <laughs> and I thought he was letting everybody know who built that. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of them and they're I, I think they're pretty interesting and cool. And they're carrying them across the whole line now. Mm -hmm. Tracy? Um, it, it's a pretty obvious one and I don't think it, it's necessarily an Easter egg, but it was something that was done in the early years and it's the script Jeep on the front of the toolbox in an old Willys. Good point. For those of you that haven't found that on a, yes, right. Lowercase Jeep in a, in a different script. If People haven't found that. On the passenger seat in the flat fender, underneath is a toolbox. If you look on the front floorboard of the, that toolbox, the vertical section, there's Jeep in script embossed. And that's a that's kind of hard to see. No one notices it there. How about you, Mike? What's your fav favorite uh, favorite Easter egg through the years? Well, Tracy just threw out the one that uh, that I wanted to bring up. About 15 years ago, Rick, you probably don't remember, but uh, my buddy Barry rebuilding his flatty, and uh, he found that. And uh, he put a piece of paper across it and took a pencil and rubbed it and scanned it and sent it to me. It was time I emailed you and said, hey, what's this? So when it comes to the Easter eggs, I remember when we found that, it felt like such a special thing. This is something no one's ever talked about. We must have something special here. So, uh, uh, yeah, the, the one on the toolbox in the front. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Favorite of mine. Uh, I did walk through a Jeep dealership months ago and was looking for Easter eggs. And there was, uh, oh shoot, now I'm going to forget it. One of their little Jeeps. It's, it's not made in the U.S., but it's got so many... Easter eggs all over it. The little Sasquatch on the rear window. Oh, that's the Jeep Renegade. Yeah, not one of our favorite models, but man, they, they sure loaded it up. And the way they 
uh, impress the um, the pattern in the sheet metal is reminiscent of, uh, of the jerry cans, supposedly to make the steel a little stronger. Uh, they did a bunch of that on that that really did. But I go back to the toolbox. That's that's my favorite one. I, I, I agree. That's a good one. Liam, how about you? Yeah, Tracy took mine too. Um, <laughs> so when I did the Gone Jeep and video about the Easter egg found on the JT, the handle, the inside handle, um, that's when I was asking the group for Easter eggs throughout history. And that's when I learned of the the script on the the old CJs. And um, ever since, I've been kind of obsessed with it. And as an interiors engineer working with Jeep, I have proposed that seven, eight, nine, 20 times as something that they should use um, on the interior. And so far, nothing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, anyway. Um, and like uh, Mike said, some of the, the non-Wrangler models actually have as many, if not more, Easter eggs than the Wrangler just because it's so much fun to find them. And and those those models are targeted towards a younger audience because of their price point. And it's um it's fun for people of all ages, but you know, it's just kind of a a neat fun thing to do. Um I did see some photos of a, a new something that I can't tell you about that I found an Easter egg on, so they're not quitting anytime soon. Um, which is great. Uh, it's, it's always fun to see those, even if it's, you know, on the computer and, and a part that doesn't exist yet. So, um, it's still, you know, just like a nice treasure hunt. Let's see. What is my favorite though? I have no idea. Um, because you guys took all the good ones. I can get, I can give you some hints. How about the headlights? Oh, you think it's an Easter egg that my headlights are square? <laughs> Oh Lord, I opened up that one. <laughs> you stepped that in off. that one, Rick. Yeah. Oh boy. There you go. No, no, I mean I mean later model uh Jeep headlights. If you've never looked right there in the center. Oh, Greg's looking right in the center. What is that? It's a, it's a Jeep, Jeep grill. Yeah. Yeah. Um you can find the Jeep grill like everywhere. I also like on the new ones the topographical topographical maps that are in like the floorboards and stuff. Um, that was another suggestion I gave him. I said, do a topographical map of uh, Moab or the Rubicon on the door panel. And they're like, you're nuts. But uh, <laughs> those are great. The one that I found on my Jeep and the YJ is void of many of these is that the, uh, at some point the power steering re reservoir cap was switched to have uh, an, an outline of the steering wheel. And when you look at the TJ, even though the components are incredibly similar, they change the cap to have the correct steering wheel, the TJ steering wheel silhouette rather than the, the YJ. So there's some attention to detail that I, I don't know if it's an Easter egg, but it's just kind of fun to find. I get it. How about you, Tyler? Well, I think the one that made me laugh the most was the payway sandals. Uh, when I first read about those, I, I had a good, pretty good laugh about it, but uh, my favorite has to be all the little silhouettes of, uh, flat fenders that, that, uh, on the wheels of the JK and on the corners of the windshields. And when yeah. they started those on there, that's, those have definitely got to be my favorite. Well, one thing about that little flat fender, if you, I'm sure you've noticed, but many of our viewers probably haven't, the location of the spare tire is on the rear, which clearly indicates a wartime Willie's MB, not a 2A or a 3A or any other flat fender. That goes all the way back to Heritage. And I think uh, probably probably was on purpose. In fact, if you talk to Mark Allen, the uh, chief Jeep designer, I think he'd probably agree. Well, and speaking of Mark Allen, maybe you can gently suggest... In one of the future concepts for EJS, the script Jeep somewhere. Hmm. 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 Okay. All right. So there's, <laughs> there's enough about Easter eggs. Eh? We'll, we'll leave with that. 
because I bet, I bet you that something like that just might happen. And I'll bet you that Tracy could probably take a picture of her Jeep Nader's Jeep and get it get it off. To I, I I could I I could get that to uh, Mark. And, Let's and make that so. Yeah, and since we've been talking about Willys and Wranglers, it's kind of a great segue into Willys versus Wrangler. And there's really not a lot to debate here, but there there is some debate. We're going to talk about wheels, old school steel, aluminum, beadlocks, pros, cons. What do you prefer to run? There you go. That's really a good one. Uh I have a feeling that the original wheels for most motor vehicles were uh, wood and steel, not aluminum. And I don't think they were beadlocks, but eventually Standard Wheel Corporation and the others, which were a predecessor of Willis Overland, by the way, uh, came up with steel wheels. Why? Because they're strong and they do everything you need to. And I'm trying to think of when aluminum wheels really made they're seen. Uh, obviously, in the aviation industry, they did due to weight. Um, probably early on, you know, you had magnesium mags, of course, for racing because they were light. Uh, nowadays, most aluminum wheels are called alloy wheels. Well, yeah, any almost any metal is an alloy. You're not going to have a pure aluminum wheel <laughs> any more than you're going to have a pure iron wheel okay steel is an alloy so when you start talking alloys yeah i got alloys on my jeep yeah okay so it's the rest of the story uh, so yes we started with steel wheels for the most part i think almost everything uh coming out now days have aluminum alloy wheels and then we go into bead locks good or bad but let's start with steel versus aluminum craig uh both Put you on the spot their, here. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, both serve their purpose, steel versus aluminum. Um, if if I had to build like a bug out vehicle, something that um, was simple and went everywhere, blah, 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 I'd probably choose steel uh, for the simple fact that you can repair a steel wheel on your own on the side of a trail with a hammer. Um, you know, if you get a dent in your ring, you can hammer it back out enough to hold air. Um, so steel is, it's a lot more workable, um, and it's more durable. Um, so I would probably choose steel in that regards, but if I was building something new and modern and blah, 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 the likelihood is I'd probably do aluminum. Um, they're lighter, they're pretty good. And if you do have big tires, you're probably not going to hurt your wheel anyway, unless you're sliding into a curb sideways, which you shouldn't be doing. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there's, it's. It's hard to narrow it down. I think it would be more vehicle based than an all around statement. Um, I will tell you that uh, I'm working on this Gladiator right now, and the spare is this beautiful steel wheel. Um, so, like, I've got it in my head right now get a big pile of those spares and fully outfit a brand new JL with steel wheels that look nice. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, I mean, there's there's been some concept cars that, that did that. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the names of them, but you know, back in 2007, uh, the Skunk Works team at the time came out with a tan JK, and I don't remember what they called it. Um, yeah, or the no, J10. Yeah, the J10. Mm -hmm. Yep, but it, it it used the spare tire wheel off of a Grand Cherokee at the time, um, you know, but gave it this really cool military old school look. So. Um, I think there's a there's a lot to be said about steel wheels, and I, I think that they should get a little bit more use than they do. Um, but people like the changes of aluminum, so it's it's not one I can pick a hundred percent for all around use. Well, what you said about being vehicle specific, uh, I think, really holds some water because it can be not just vehicle but use specific. For instance, most racing applications, whether it be on or, or off road. Weight is always a consideration, and for that consideration, you want to have a, a strong aluminum wheel. Not only that, a wheel is called unsprung weight. In other words, it's on the axle. It's not a bug. So the amount of movement that the suspension goes through, you're going to have better a reaction of your suspension 
with less mass moving up and down. So that's another reason that they use uh, aluminum wheels. Tyler, how are you? I'm all about the steel wheels. They're cheap, they're mm -hmm. strong, you can repair them on the trail. And I'm a guy who's really not interested in aesthetics all that much. <laughs> so I don't care. I don't care that they're simple. I don't care that they're dated. I just, I love, I love steel wheels. They're so, so easy to repair, much easier to repair, more durable. I actually did a test where I, I took a, an aluminum alloy wheel and a steel wheel and I ran them up my gravel road and back for two miles on the washboardy gravel without a tire on them. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> about two minutes with a file and I was able to remount a tire on the steel wheel. The aluminum wheel was completely destroyed, cracked, chunks of it missing. So, you know, for me, I just, I just prefer steel. I'm a simple man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, you yeah, have a good point, and your test is somewhat to what I, I did uh, about 20 years ago at Four Wheel and Off Road. Is I was actually got a giant sledgehammer. I mean, you know, a long single jack, man, double jack, wham, beating on aluminum rims that I got from a company that agreed to do this test just to show what happens. Now, uh, there is a difference between a cast aluminum rim and a forged aluminum rim, obviously. Uh, and that's one of the big differences too. If you're going to be going full on racing, you're going to want to uh, forge. Cast can crack, and then you've got a problem. And like Greg said, almost anybody can fix a steel wheel. I, I mean, I, I do it a lot. <laughs> I've got a lot of old wheels uh, that need, need a lot of help. So yeah, being sim simple is good. You can fix a steel wheel. Liam, how about you? Rick, if you looked out your window, you'd probably see that I have Cherokee wheels on my YJ. And I, <laughs> I think those are aluminum. They're a heck of a lot lighter than a steel wheel. Um, but really for me, I just kind of pick whatever looks good. Um, and most of that is because, so my YJ, it's not amazing on the trail because it's been my daily, dra daily driver since I bought it. Um, there was a period of time where both my wife and I had one vehicle and it was a 94 YJ that had a million issues and just simply didn't care because it's the Jeep. Um, and so I picked, actually those wheels came with it and I just kind of fell in love with the honeycomb shape of the, the Cherokee wheels. And so I slapped some black paint on them and called it good. Um, as far as, you know, steel versus aluminum, there's definite advantages to steel. Um, as far as on road, I would say there's probably more advantages to aluminum just because it's, you can make aluminum very strong. You can make aluminum relatively impact resistant and it's obviously a lot lighter, but you're also not sliding sideways into a boulder on the highway, hopefully. So it's, it's definitely, like you said, vehicle specific and what, what you want to do with it. Or like me, if you just found a wheel that you just really like the look of it, go for it. I don't know. Yeah, well, you got to have wheels, got to have tires. You don't have to have an engine, it'll still roll. But you got to have wheels and tires. And one thing about the new JT, I think it's one of the very few vehicles that you can order brand new with steel wheels and roll-up windows. Remember what those are? Yeah, roll-up windows. So, Tracy, what's your preference, steel or aluminum? I'm a steel wheel girl, and uh, heading back from Moab, blowing a tire, flat towing, tater, that steel wheel took a pretty good beating at having to drag it up Glenwood Canyon over two miles till it could get pulled over into a safer zone. And I wish I had steel wheels on my pickup because up here in this country, you know, falling rocks everywhere. You, you're going to come around a curve and there's going to be a boulder in the road. I, I remember heading over towards southwestern Colorado and going up to Norwood Hill in a rainstorm and there's VW sized boulders coming down across the road in a washout. And then there's small bucket sized boulders that you're trying to navigate to get around and 
that's a deadly hill for me. I've been through there numerous times when it looks like it's going to give away. Um, so steel's the best for you, then? Steel's the best for me. Now, I like the look of some of the aluminum stuff. You know, you can get the pretty shiny blingy and, and whatnot. But looking at it from a utilitarian purpose, it's got to be a steel wheel. There you go. Well, and, you know, one more steel wheel story just for fun. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did a J. It was one of the very first JLs, and I did it for SEMA, and I called it the J-18, where I put leaf springs on it and all of the J-8 military parts, the bumpers, the wheels, the axles, blah, blah, blah. Um, those wheels have impressed me so much. So those, they're the military spec wheels for the J-8. Um, and, you know, if you look at a lot of steel wheels, you'll notice that they're, they're stamped steel, the center section. And the stamping actually work hardens the steel and gives it shape and dimension. So it makes it stronger. So you can use much thinner steel for a lot of strength. Um, and most steel wheels that you see are like 16th inch thick, or some of them are eighth inch thick, but usually they're relatively thin. And the military J8 wheels, because they were supposed to be able to handle an IED, um, it was stamped 3 16th plate. So those wheels were incredibly heavy. Um, but super, super cool. The downfall is they're very, very hard to get here in the United States. Um, and I don't even know if they're producing them anymore, um, but really cool steel wheel. And you know that wheel, if you think of that, it can handle an explosion on the side of the road and keep our, you know, the military driving. Um, pretty cool, you know, and you couldn't do that with a piece of aluminum. I'm sorry, you just couldn't. Okay, I need those to drive Glenwood Canyon. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, they, they, they would the actually fit on your Ram, which is the nice part. You can get those. They will oh, fit right. your five lug bolt pattern. Five on five and a half or four. Yeah. So it sounds to me they're heavy enough to be called anti-rollover devices. Oh, probably. <laughs> All right, Mike, how about you? I'll, I'll keep it simple. Uh, uh, kind of like Liam, you know, what looks good, what I can afford. Um, I'll go with steel. Uh the way I drive and my budget these days, uh, it still works just fine for me. Well, it makes sense. Steel is, of course, the, the original style. It works in every situation. Again, JT's, JL's still can be bought factory with steel wheels. I'm not sure there's a lot of other vehicles that are, other than some uh, probably white pickups because you know, they're for fleets. Uh, aluminum has their place, absolutely. When you're running around with lack of power, sometimes that, you know, like like a four cylinder, yeah, you can actually feel a difference between regular stock steel wheels and aftermarket aluminum. So if that's your thing, you need a little extra power, you might want to do it. But steel is going to get you home virtually regardless. All right. And and for the really budget-minded people, a steel wheel, um, there's kits on the market if you're a welder or a fabricator. If you don't want to buy a whole secondary set of wheels for your vehicle and you do opt for those steel wheels, you can get the weld on beadlock kits where you weld it on yourself. So much more inexpensive than buying a big fancy beadlock um, requires some sweat equity. But if you chose steel wheels in the beginning, you're already off to a good start if you want beadlocks. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think more people will be able to weld steel than aluminum. Mm -hmm. So. All right, so that's uh, pretty much Willie's versus Wrangler. What do we have next, Casey? We've got toolbox talk, and there there's been some some stuff going on with in our core group in the last few months on parts, buying parts for your Jeep, and especially some of the older Jeeps and the subtle changes that Jeep has made that has created issues. And in walking into the parts store saying. I want a water pump <laughs> or I yeah. want this or I want that. And I, I think that we need to address some of this stuff and, and not from a negative standpoint, but just kind of give everybody a little heads up to really do your research when you're walking into the local parts store and saying, this is what I'm looking for because it could mean the difference of a couple hundred bucks in some instances. 
easily, easily. And I think uh, uh, a couple of the instances you're talking about uh, happened with uh, Liam rebuilding the 304 with water pump and with uh, Chris Collard getting a water pump for his 258. And yeah, small changes exist and that's always important. But first I want to say how many things stay the same. For instance, the wheel bolt pattern on a Jeep from the beginning has been five on five and a half. That changed when we went to the YJ. So you had, uh, you know, 50 some years of perfectly good wheel pattern, which is still used by. I'm five, five and a half. Uh, you are five yep. on five and a half. You're yep. five on four and a half, Liam. We should be five mm -hmm. on. I bought I'm the wrong wheels then. All YJs are five on four and a half. And that was the problem. The first YJ came out with non-standard, as we call them, wheels. And <laughs> so, and again, why did they change? Well, there was engineering reasons uh, for packaging, for load rating, for everything else. Um, fortunately, they didn't downsize the lug nut size. It's still half half 20. And that's, that's full-size vehicle rather than 716s with six on a five circle and all that kind of stuff. So let's go to your water pump, Liam. Uh, what'd you find on your 304 that you're doing in your commando? Yeah. And apparently I've been shopping for the wrong wheels this whole time for my YJ. Good thing I never bought any. Good thing. I was very convinced that was five on five and a half. So now. But, but remember Bronco has five on five and a half. A real Bronco. <laughs> no, so I resolved. My oh, water wait a minute! Issue. So does Scout. Oh, all right. So your issue? Yep, I resolved my water pump issue. Um, it came in the form of a pulley. So, and this this topic is actually, as far as money saving goes, it it goes even further into Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, and junkyards. Because most parts stores, you can walk in, tell them the model of your Jeep, unless you're like me and you have parts from like seven different time periods on your Jeep um, and some PVC pipe in some cases, but we'll talk about that later. Um, you know, usually they just tell you and here's here's the parts you need. Now, when you're walking to a junkyard and you have a 94 and there's a 95 sitting there, are the parts going to match? That's where this knowledge really comes into play. And that's what happened to me on the Commando. I bought a new engine or a newly remanufactured engine off Facebook Marketplace, a 304, and I dropped it in the 72 Commando. Well, here's the problem. The engine was built for a 73 plus, which means that everything is the exact same with the exception of the water pump uh, depth. They changed it. And you can buy a shorter water pump for the older engines. It's about 250 bucks. You can buy a longer water pump for the newer engine. It's about 16 bucks. So there's a huge difference there. And uh, what I learned was that the, the crank pulley also changed from a three bolt to a four bolt. And luckily mine had come with another, with, with a balancer and a, a four bolt pulley. So I already had all that. All I needed to do was to get the correct water pump pulley to get everything to line up. Somehow the alternator and the water pump or not, and the power steering pump lined up with both setups, which I, that's what forum said. I still don't fully believe that um, because I have two alternators and they're different lengths. One of them works, the other one doesn't. So those are the things to look at for uh, in this case or in Chris's case, going from a serpentine belt from a V drive, it changes the direction of the water pump spinning. Yes, it does on the AMC 258s. In fact, uh, Tyler, you can probably speak to this. Yeah, well, my uh, my 87 Comanche is actually the four-cylinder, but I found out when I did a water pump on it that there were both left and right spinning pumps for that same engine for that same year. So <laughs> I uh, I took my old pump off, and I I, did, I took it with me down to the store and, or down to my part, my local parts place. And he says, yeah, it's, it's calling for two different numbers on this. One's a left rotation, one's a right rotation. Which one do you have? And I said, this? No, I had <laughs> old pump. I said, oh. I don't, 
you know, what, look at the impeller, see if you can figure it out. Well, we figured out mine was a left hand eventually, but, uh, yeah, I mean that, and that's same model year, same engine configuration. Wow. Yeah. But it, the, the difference is AC or no AC. Yeah. And I do not have AC. So that's probably what the difference was. Yeah. And you have a serpentine belt. Uh, yes. Mine's a serpentine. Right. So no AC reverses the rotation when it goes around. So those are the little, little tricks. Uh, you'll find if you like uh, Chris Collar did, who didn't think anything about it. He pulled off his 258 water pump because he was like, there's a uh, replace it. So he bought one, he put it in. They're overheated. So something's not right here. So what happens on his, the there was no heat into the heater. And what you'll find is if you put the wrong rotation on, it'll idle fine and won't overheat, but you won't get any heat out of your heater. And then when you go to drive it, it will overheat nearly immediately because it's not pumping the right way. So you got the right one, you fixed it. And like yours, Liam, uh, I wonder about your 304. You haven't driven it yet, right? Not yet. I, I actually got it to get up to temperature last night, though. Okay. And it's an automatic? Yeah. Okay, because some of those years, again, 72 and 3 may have used a different flex plate. But if it's started, that means your starter to flex plate engagement is correct. So as long as it's hooked your torque converter correctly, you're gold. I hope so. I reused the torque converter and flex plate from the original engine. So we right. should be and in it good shape. Up. Okay. Oh, yeah. No problem. Well, there's a spacer that was needed. Because my engine right. may have come off of a non-Jeep, but I was able to reuse enough components from the original engine. Yeah. Right. So what's one of the one part that is, oh, I would say the longest lasting part that goes from World War II Jeeps all the way up past YJs and some TJs? What is the same part? And if you break it, I probably am carrying a spare. You U joint? Bingo. That's right, Tyler. Same thing. 1310 series, Spicer 5-153X. Same dang joint the whole time. So that tells you how common it is and how good it is. Yet when you go into some parts store and the guy or gal behind the counter says, for what kind of car, my friend? And you tell them a 70 one Jeep take them and they can't look it up. So yeah, order it for a 79 CJ5 and you'll be fine. But you, Tracy, you've run into this stuff. Not not in the uh in the last decade or so I haven't run into any of that. So you're you're lucky. Yeah. First we you have a great part store experience looking for ignition wrenches. Yeah. Not that everybody knows what ignition wrenches are. True. Um, I haven't really run into to any issues. I, I normally go scouring for the obsolete, hard-to-find parts for other people. <laughs> yeah, and you find those. How about you, Mike? Uh, I haven't had any trouble, but, you know, I don't work on my own Jeep. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's here's the final thing. Here's the a quiz, much like the U joint. What is the only multi-component automotive part that is the same from the model A through today? Every single one of our vehicles. All joint? A what? A ball joint? Model A ball joint isn't going to fit on your XJ. Mm. Multi-component part. <clears throat> Gas cap, I don't know. Drive shaft? Not a bad. Come on, your drive shaft fit my drive shaft? Maybe. It's <laughs> no. Radiator cap. Um. No, no, 
Gas cap radiator, yeah, a lot of vehicles do have interchangeable parts. Don't get me wrong. Just like that U joint. Light switch. <laughs> no. I want to say spark plug. Close. It has something to do with pressure and holding pressure in. Oil pressure? No. There's no. a million different ones. How about air pressure? Valve stem. Oh, you're so close. What's inside a valve stem? Valve, valve core. core. Right, a Schrader valve. <laughs> mm. ah, every one of your vehicles. And some more than others because you have it in your air conditioning line and you have it in your fuel injection line. Jeez, it's even in bicycles and motorcycles. It's it, you know, that Schrader valve is everywhere. Yep. So there's your tech tip of the day. Okay. <laughs> mm. Mm. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> Let's get into some fun stuff with trail side. Let's talk about our favorite trails in our home state. And should you be from someplace that doesn't have a whole lot of trail systems, you know, like what, Nebraska? Oh, wait, no, they actually have some pretty cool uh, trails over in Nebraska. Um, Delaware. Maybe a, a, a favorite trail of all time. Long Island. There we go. Yeah. Central Park ought to be awesome when you went there. Yeah. They have granite boulders. Sure. Yeah. Let's I'm talk about our favorite trails from our home state. Great. Well, what's your favorite? Mine is Wheeler Lake. It's about 45 minutes from my house. And in Colorado. It, in Colorado. No. So, yeah. It, it's... um. At one point in time, I would say it was a light to moderately trafficked trail, but no longer. It's a moderate to heavily trafficked trail. It's a five-mile in-and-out trail that is moderate to low difficult. Starts at just under 11,000 feet in elevation, goes to a little over 12.1. Mm-hmm. And you get into the action right off the bat. And you've got to be in four low for about the first mile and a half. And then after that, you know, it kind of mellows out, meanders through a lot of water. It's heavily overgrown with brush. So if you don't want any pinstriping or anything on your Jeep or your top, don't go do this trail. Uh, Not a lot of places to pull off and wait for traffic to come down or get around you or whatever. So, I would suggest going maybe on a Tuesday or Wednesday if you really want to enjoy it. Most of the trail starts going through uh, private property. So don't camp until you get out of the private property. But there's chances for flips, flops, rollovers, um, severe axle breakage. Um, yeah, but it's a fun trail. It's beautiful. Can you go around? Can you go around on the hump stuff? Um, l- less challenging go arounds, I would say. Okay, so you can um, pick your line. You can pick your line. Um, if you want to break it, you know, when you get up to an area I like to call pick your poison, there's three routes. It's commonly known as the V notch. If you take the left hand route, if you're very aggressive on the throttle, you will snap an axle shaft. If you're going to take the V-notch, you definitely need a spotter going through that, or you will lay over on your side going into that. If you want to take the easy route, you do the Z-turn up through the middle of them. Once you get to Bowling Ball Hill, that's where your challenges come in, because it will change after every vehicle that goes through it. It's a relatively steep incline that's boulder-covered. So you get somebody that wants to go up through there a little fast. It's going to start rolling these bowling ball sized boulders down through there and it's going to change. You can get high centered pretty easily. Then you get to the big rock and that marks a very tight right hand turn through a narrow squeeze with some ledges. But when you get up to the top and the lake, you will be rewarded with the most amazing views down valley. There's a waterfall up there and wildflowers galore. The biggest thing is it's a very short duration trail as far as the time that it's open. 
it's very dependent on what the winter before has been like and what the oncoming winter is going to be. Sometimes the trail doesn't open till mid July and you can be snowed out the first week of August. <laughs> because it's Colorado. Exactly. That sounds awesome. How about You've been you, Mike? on that trail, Rick. Oh, yeah, yes. That's yeah, a good trail. How about you, Mike? Uh, well, that's kind of a difficult one here in Indiana. Um, I wouldn't say that there's uh, trails like I was accustomed to when I lived in California. It's more uh, parks out here. There's a place called Badlands. I couldn't actually name one of the trails, but I go out there dinking around and I do some things out there. There's also uh, Hasman's Acres, which is like 750 acres, pretty good. Um, so I can't really name a favorite trail here back in my home state of Indiana, but uh, when I was in California, I would uh, like to go out to Glamis, and then there was a route of dry lake beds that we would run literally all night long, and uh, we'd end up on this little tributary that comes off Colorado River that has three state camp spots. There's nothing around, there's no one around, but there's three state camp spots right on the water. And so even though it's not in my home state of Indiana, that's probably one of my favorite trails. Uh, activities used to do about 20 years ago. Well, that's what's cool is finding a place where there's no one around. That's my, that's my kind of trail. And I have a few of those. How about you, Greg? Um, Michigan's, you know, it's really, really diverse and there's a lot of things in Michigan. Um, I don't know, there's well over 4,000 miles of ORV trails in Michigan that are open to the public as well as multiple off-road parks. Um, you know, we have a, t a bevy of them from rocks and valleys to Bundy Hill and they cover the entire, the entire state, uh, even up into the UP. Um, but I gotta say probably my overall favorite for any type of vehicle that you want to bring is Silver Lake Sand Dunes. Um, I don't go a ton, you know, maybe once a year or once every couple of years, but um, Silver Lake Sand Dunes is open to the public. Uh, it is a public park and it is a driving park. So it's not a trail, um, but it is a very large, you know, multiple miles of sand dunes um, that come right off of Lake Michigan. So the waters of Lake Michigan build the sand dunes and change the scope of the sand dunes every year. Um, there are a few hills that are almost always the same. You know, you've got Test Hill, which is the first big one, and then multiple others. But, um, you know, you could take a 1946 CJ2A and have fun all day long, um, as well as somebody could take a $200,000 Gladiator that they just had built with a big Hemi and everything else, and they could have a lot of fun. Um, so it, it's, it's fun for everybody. Um, you can go fast, you can go slow, you can play in water, which is fresh water. So you're not going to rot out your car. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, they even do sand drags and other stuff. So you can watch people, um, go really fast. If you're not one of them, you can at least spectate. Um, you know, you do have to work use flags and stuff and accidents do happen when people are playing in motorsports in an open area. So, you know, follow the rules and do all the safe stuff. But I think overall, that's probably the one that I would rate the top in Michigan for anybody to go to. Um, and you can have a lot of fun there. Now, there are some parks with some really good rocks and mud and other stuff. But um, I think for for a family fun adventure and, you know, maybe if we ever get lucky, a nice gone Jeep and trail ride, we could all go up there, pitch a tent at the neighboring campground and have a good weekend. Well, I still haven't made it out to Silver Lake. That's one really that's on my bucket list. Oh, well, whenever you're ready, uh, you know, I've got a place and we can go up there and have some fun. Um, I'm sure Liam and you know everybody else that's willing would come along, but you would you would really like it now. Um, you know, countrywide, if you're talking sand dunes, I think the ones in Florence, Oregon are probably the best in our entire country. They dwarf all other sand dunes and they're a lot of fun, but um yeah, in Michigan, Silver Lake Sand Dunes, uh, best overall family fun. And the, the town right next to the sand dunes, it, it is a tourist town. So during the day, you can have ice cream and go go-karting and play mini golf and do all the other stuff. So it's 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 really opens it up to a, a really good day adventure. Um, 
so yeah, that, that's what I would say as far as Michigan. That's cool. All right, Tyler, you're on the hot spot, hot seat now. You live in Pick Utah. Mr. Utah. <laughs> or is it just the whole state? Yeah, I do have I do have a favorite trail though. And it's uh it'd have to be the hole in the rock trail. Um it's mainly so its appeal for me is, is a comes from a couple of things. The first thing is the history of it. When you go out and do that trail in that country and it's as difficult as it is in a modern four wheel drive, highly modified modern four wheel drive. And then you realize that a bunch of pioneers with wagons cut that trail and I mean, it was, it was literally the end of the world for those, or end of the earth for those guys. I mean, there was, they were sent out there to set up a colony for the sole purpose of trying to bring law and order. I mean, that, that whole region, there were three Indian tribes at war with each other. There was, it was full of cattle rustlers and banditos and, and everybody that was trying to hide from the law would go out to that country. And so these, these settlers were sent out there to, to make a, to establish a colony to try and bring law and order to the area. And I mean, literally in, in oxen and horse drawn wagons, they did this trail and you will, you'll struggle for a couple of days to do it in a four wheel drive. It's got some really, it's got some really good technical sections. Um, the other thing that appeals to me with it is it's not like Moab where if you break something, there's 15 parts stores, 15 minutes away. When you're out on the hole in the rock, you are hundreds of miles. I mean, your closest anywhere that might have parts would be Hanksville. And I don't even know that Hanksville, I mean, they probably have to order anything in for you. And it's, I think, 98 miles away over rough terrain to get there. And uh, so you're very, when you go out there, you're unsupported. You've got to take everything with you. If you break, you have to fix it. There's nobody going to come out there and recover your vehicle for you. And it's just, it's remote. It's rugged. It's got a neat history and it is so beautiful. When you get up on top of Gray Mesa and you're overlooking the San Juan river arm of Lake Powell and the big goosenecks up there, it is just so profoundly beautiful. And then to think, I mean, right up there at that very spot, a woman gave birth on the front seat of a wagon in a howling blizzard in December. And two days later, she was up in that wagon with her newborn child doing the rest of the trail. And it's like, who were these people? <laughs> they, who were these people? They named the kid Rio because it overlooked the San Juan River. So this kid's name was Rio. Just amazing such an amazing trail just just mind-blowing trail they were a hardy bunch back then and you know it, it was a testament to their inner self I'll say. what those people went through and i i read a lot about a lot of that and you know here we are in our air-conditioned vehicles and <laughs> or should i say air-conditioned gas-powered mobiles Right, right. Doing yeah. what it took them months to do in a couple of days. And they didn't well, give up. They kept the going. Seat of that wagon giving birth. Her husband is desperately trying to pitch a tent in this howling blizzard. Well, she ends up delivering the child while he's trying to get the tent set up. They spend two days in the tent. The wind was blowing so hard. She actually had to reach up and grab the center post of the tent and hold it down so the tent wouldn't get blown away during those two days. Wow. Now, when you go drive that trail in your four-wheel drive, you're sore. Your neck sore, your butt sore. That trail is just rough. And she, two days after giving birth, she hopped on a wagon, <laughs> a wooden seat on a wagon, and went another... I mean, they weren't even, they weren't even halfway through the trail at that point. So <laughs> it's insane, man. I mean, you want to talk about some tough people. Well, those, yeah. those were some tough people. 
Well, I don't think I can outdo that 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 description of that trail. So I'm going to let Liam try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should have had Tyler go last because the line's going to suck compared to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, hold my Bud Light. We're going to Iowa. So awesome. here's no. You live in yeah, Michigan. I live in Michigan now, but yeah. I I started my jeeping career in Iowa, which is where I started my life as well. So <laughs> here's the deal. We, I think, I think the state of Iowa has an off-road park, maybe two, maybe. Um, but I was never one. They were far away. Like, I don't know. Far away to me back then was like 45, 50 minutes. Now I go visit the family <laughs> 10 hours away, but um, so they were too far away and they cost money. And that was not going to fly. So I grew up in Cedar Rapids and kind of the, the thing that we figured out was if you could find a river on the map, the area next to the river that's just too soupy or, you know, during flood season would, would fill up. They don't build anything there. And so you might be able to get away with wheeling there. And so we would oftentimes bring police scanners with us wheeling to hear when people are calling us in. So then we could get off the trail and pretend that the mud came from somewhere else. Um, and that's not, it's not a good thing to do. Um, but what we had, what we had tried to do, and actually I was just reminded of this on Facebook because I had taken a video of a trail day that the local Jeep club had done in one of these places. And um, someone in the club had reposted it, said it's a real shame we can't go there anymore because the the local law enforcement had blocked it off and put some big fines on going in there. But what we were trying to do at the time was clean up the area, as most most of us do, because it's a common party spot and they people burn couches and there was just metric tons of trash. So we tried to clean up the area and petition that you know we should be able to use this as as jeeping trails. Granted, you know Tyler's talking about being hundreds of miles away and trails that can take more than 15 minutes. This thing you could do the whole lot in like 25 minutes to a half hour. Um, and I mean, if you looked over, there's a restaurant right, right there. Um, because that's, you know, no longer flood zone. <laughs> and that's, and that's really the extent of it coming to Michigan, uh, as an interning out here, when I first started, I, I live here now. Um, Silver Lake sta- sand dunes blew my mind. One, I wasn't sure if sand dunes actually existed. I had seen them, or in the United States, I had seen them like the Sahara Desert and all this stuff. And I said, "Yep, that's and not even the Sahara, but like wherever Moses got lost for forty days and nights, that's sand dunes to me." And it probably wasn't even like that. Seeing that in the Midwest just blew me away. And like uh, Greg said, it's so much fun over there, like lots of family atmosphere. And it's just, it's very relaxed. And even my four cylinder YJ can make it to the top of uh, test hill. And I almost died on the way down. And now I've got video of that. So that's pretty cool. Um, but as far as Iowa goes, the pretty much anytime we off road or vacation or seek out anything fun, we leave the state. That sounds great. I like that test deal. Now your life is complete, right? Yeah. Good. Tracy? Speaking of sand dunes, we actually have some dunes here, and I'm not in Colorado. I'm not talking about Great Sand Dunes National Park. We have what's called the North Park Dunes. And you can actually go and drive on these dunes. And what's really cool about it is there's trails through the mountains, and you come off the trails that are going up through the pines and the rocks you cross the creek and then you're driving on sand dunes but all the way around you are snow cap peaks so it's actually really really cool to go and play there and that that could be a, a neat location to maybe try a gone jeep and trip in addition to going to silver lakes and whatnot the only thing i will say the best time to go is when it's really really hot up here in colorado which generally is the end of July, first part of August before the snow starts to fly. Because if you go in June, when they first open, you will be just covered in mosquitoes. You do not go with an open vehicle. You want something that is tightly closed and airtight and then don't get out. 
<laughs> Those are that, horrible up there. That would so, not be any of my vehicles. <laughs> yeah, mine either. So, you know, wait till late summer when they've kind of died off. That's like in a lot of places. And, and that reminded me of some other trails that I wanted to talk about, like in Belize. And, well, wait, I don't live there, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I'm from Arizona. I spent too much time in California, but I'm back in Arizona, so I'm going to pick an Arizona trail. Yeah, but if we talked about your home state, Rick, you're from Alaska. Okay, yeah, yeah, yep, that's where I was born and raised, and I will probably pass on that, because the one trail that is my favorite, I don't feel I want anybody else to go there. So, okay, that's a good thing, so we'll, yeah. we'll go to your current home state. We're, we're going to go to Arizona. Um, so my favorite trail is definitely here in Arizona. And it was a toss up between a, a couple of them, but I gotta say, Table Mesa is a collection of trails that's not to be outdone by anything. There's more rock crawling, sand running, washes, uh, lots of off camber stuff. And it's all in basically creek bottom. So if you do roll over, you're not gonna go 30 feet to death or anything like that. Yeah, you roll over, you may have some problems, but it's just a roll, no worries. It has some high pucker accents, ascents. It has uh, some descents that'll knock your socks off, but it also has some easier go around and stuff that just about any vehicle can do. I don't wanna say stock, unless you stay on the road. That's the other nice thing. A lot of the Table Mesa trails have a road, an access road around it. That makes it great for people to come and watch what you're doing in case they don't want to be as crazy as you. I tend to be a little bit pushing the edge on, uh, depending on the vehicle and the trail and the time and who I'm with, uh, whereas other times I'm going to be nice and mellow and just stay in the background, let everybody else break their stuff. And believe me, I have seen stuff break on Table Mesa. Like Tracy was saying on Montreal, it's guaranteed to be, break an axle if you get crazy. And there's some of these places on Table Mesa, too, where you'll get to that certain point where all of your weights on one rear axle and you start hopping and throttling out, you're not going to have a good outcome. So overall, my vote's for tra Table Mesa in Arizona. So I think that's probably what we all needed to know, where we're going to go next time. If we can get all of our group to get together and go on a trail, Sounds like we're each going to have to supply more in one sheet. Can you do that, uh, Greg? Of course. <laughs> yeah, oh. uh, typically I can supply a couple. Um, yeah. I know Tyler could, could come up with a couple of XJs if we were out in his neck of the woods. Liam's hurting right now because he only has two. Tracy has one. I've got plenty. Uh, Mike has one. So let's think about what we're going to do in the future. I've, I've got an idea. We could all go to Arizona. We could all borrow a Rick Jeep and then we get to take it home. Except for the last part, I'm good with that. <laughs> I'll take home the one I've got there. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, for for okay. those that are just listening and weren't watching, the look that came across Rick's face when Greg said we can all take it home was priceless. <laughs> no, but you may have to work on some of them before we can go wheeling, too, right? Well, if you work on it and bleed on it, then you get to take it home. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> if that was the case, I'd have more Jeeps than I have now. Yeah, Taylor right, would live at, at, at your house because <laughs> she, she's drawn blood on you a few times, and the brown one's drawn blood on you a few times. And There you go. Yeah, I, I have the stars to prove it. Yeah, uh, I think that's probably going to wrap up episode eight. We definitely want you guys to chime in on your thoughts on YouTube memberships. So uh, again, drop a comment on the YouTube version if you're watching it. Leave us a, a note or a comment on social media. Send us an email. If you want to help us keep the lights on, we would greatly appreciate it and love you even more than we do yeah we we would really really appreciate it because we don't want to see rick's only fan page there you go Jeep love to you all <laughs> all right guys that's a, that's a wrap uh thank you all for 
participating. Hopefully we'll get some good feedback on this. Uh, until the next time, I'm Rick Payway for Gone Cheapin, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And I'm Tracy Clark, your co-host for Gone Jeepin, and send us your questions for our Lockers Before Light Bar section, and we'll answer them on the next podcast. Take go. care, stay safe, keep warm, and uh, we'll see you on episode nine. Adios. General Zinu. On the next episode of the Gone Jeep and Show, we'll have lockers before light bars where we will answer some of our fans' questions. Willie's versus Wrangler. Rick Payway faces off against the new guys, old school versus modern technology. And Trailside, where we will discuss some of our favorite trails and trips we'd like to take. Thanks for joining us on the Gone Jeep and Show. We'll see you at the next episode. We're all Jeep all the time. <laughs>